Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kelly Suzanne Salisbury, and I'm co-chair of Pride Action Tanks Advisory Council and had the pleasure of being a member of the Southside Needs Assessment Steering Committee. I am so excited that we've arrived at this moment. Drum roll, please. The release of the Southside Needs Assessment Final Report. In late 2019, Howard Brown Health partnered with Pride Action Tank to develop and conduct a community input process to inform decision-making regarding plans for the healthcare and LGBTQ plus affirming social services facility it will be building on the south side of Chicago. This multi-phase project was made possible through the combined efforts of State Representative Lamont Robinson, Governor J.B. Pritzker, Majority Leader Gregory Harris, and other supporters in the Illinois General Assembly. Tonight, we'll be talking to Representative Lamont Robinson, Shannon Lynn Parker of Howard Brown Health, and Kim L. Hunt of Pride Action Tank about this project. Before we get started, I want to tell you a bit about Pride Action Tank, or as we know it, PAT. For nearly six years, PAT has been a multi-issue project incubator and think tank focused on action that leads to improved outcomes and opportunities for LGBTQ plus people and other marginalized groups. PAT is housed under the Policy and Advocacy Department of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. PAT's signature activity is organizing biannual summits on various topics that are important to LGBTQ plus people. These summits are co-created with committees made up of teams that include people with lived experience, scholars, funders, service providers, policymakers, and others. Each summit results in its own set of projects. PAT also works on public and administrative policy changes, provides intersectional, empathy-informed cultural humility trainings and education programs, as well as research projects that lead to the transformation of stories of individuals' resilience and joy to stories of systems changes that lead to new futures where LGBTQ plus people, particularly those with intersecting marginalized identities, can thrive. We have a short time together, so let's get to it. We're using the webinar version of Zoom, so those of you in the Zoom with us are on mute. We're also streaming on Pride Action Tanks and Howard Brown's Facebook pages. Whether you're joining us on Zoom or Facebook, feel free to add questions or comments in the chat or Facebook feed. We'll be monitoring those as we go, so please don't be shy. Post those comments and questions. We look forward to uh, having them. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists in the order that they'll speak. Each will take a few minutes for opening remarks. Then I'll ask some questions before turning to audience questions and comments. So don't forget to put them in the chat or Q&A tab. All right, here we go. State Representative Lamont J. Robinson is a lifelong Chicagoan who has dedicated his life to giving back to the city through public service and as a businessman, college professor and director of the youth mentorship program. A resident of Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood, whoop, whoop, Representative Lamont was elected in November 2018 to represent the sprawling Illinois Fifth House District that runs from Goethe Street on Chicago's north side to 80th Street on the south side. With an undergraduate degree in business marketing from Clark Atlanta University, and an MBA degree from National Lewis University, Representative Robinson became a licensed insurance agent and owner of the Robinson and Caban Insurance Group. He also was a business professor at Harold Washington College and director of the Kappa Leadership Institute in Chicago, which provides guidance to young men and prepares them to go to college. He made history as the first out LGBTQ African-American to be elected to the Illinois General Assembly. Kim L. Hunt is the Executive Director of Pride Action Tank. 
a project of AIDS Foundation Chicago, where she also serves as the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy Operations. She drives the innovation, collaboration, and learning necessary to make Pride Action Tank a leader in improving the health, safety, and progress of individuals and groups within the LGBTQ plus communities in the Midwest. In her roles, Ms. Hunt builds relationships among stakeholders and a culture that enables inclusion and innovation by ensuring that all participants can fully participate in co-creating ideas and community. Ms. Hunt is also a founding co-host of Outspoken LGBTQ Stories, where Shannon Lynn Parker, our other panelists, shared her story and serves on numerous boards, advisory councils, and civic committees. Shannon Lynn Parker is a human rights advocate, public speaker, community-centric leader, and is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Howard Brown Health. In conjunction to her role at Howard Brown Health, Shannon is a member of the executive leadership team and serves on the board of directors at Equality Illinois and the Transformative Justice Law Project. Prior to her current role, Shannon was the manager of the Broadway Youth Center's Youth Development Program and manager of Chicago House Social Service Agency's Trans Life Project in 2017, where she supported over 500 LGBTQ plus youth and adults secure permanent stable housing. Most recently, Shannon made 2020's Cranes Business Chicago LGBTQ executives and businesses championing diversity and inclusion list. You go girl. She is the first openly transgender woman to work in the Cook County Department of Corrections, working with populations in protective custody. Her honors include the inaugural Trans 100 awardee, White House speaker, National HIV and AIDS Strategy, Chicago Women's March Speaker, the Henrietta Lacks Award, Women in Health in Chicago and Equality Illinois' prestigious Humanitarian Freedom Award. Wow. Um, so let's give a warm and hearty welcome in our respective locations to our very distinguished panelists. And I'm, I'm just really honored, very happy to be here with all of the panelists and with all of you tuning in uh, via the live stream on Facebook. Um, so welcome everyone and welcome panelists. All right, so Rep Representative Robinson, let's start with your opening remarks, okay? And then uh, we'll go from there. All right, and I'll be a timekeeper to make sure we stay on track. So uh, Representative Robinson, the floor is yours. Kelly, thank you so very much uh, for allowing me this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Kelly, for all of the amazing work that you do for the LGBTQ community. It's so great to be on this panel um, with uh, three dynamic leaders in our community. Uh, thank you all for all of your work uh, that you do 365 days a year. I'm honored uh, this evening uh, to uh, talk about the LGBTQ Center on the South Side and all of the hard work, uh, Pride Action Tank, um, under uh, the uh, administration of Kim Hunt, uh, my dear friend, to make sure that uh, even though I had this vision uh, to uh, bring an LGBTQ Center to the South Side, Kelly, it was important that uh, the community showed up in the center. And that is why uh, Pride Action Tank uh, worked with um, organizations and community members to make sure that they were heard. We want, again, the center to show up, to show out, and be a part of all of us, that we all have ownership in the center. And so, again, I'm, I'm honored to have the vision. But it's one thing to have the vision, Kelly, it takes the village to make sure that that vision comes into reality. And so I wanna thank uh, Shannon, Howard Brown, I wanna uh, thank uh, Kim Hunt for allowing me uh, to shape this vision to bring a very special center, a very, a very uh, needed center to the South Side of Chicago. Uh, Kelly, I also would be remiss uh, if I didn't say that this is just the start. We need the same type of center on the South 
south uh, side of Chicago, far south side of Chicago. We need the same type of center on the far west side of Chicago. And so again, this is just a start and we need these centers all across the state because the LGBTQ community needs a place to be able to call home, needs a place to be able to feel comfortable. And so again, this is just the start of something great and I'm so honored uh, to work uh, with you and uh, the panel that has been uh, brought together today to talk about the center and all of the great work that we're looking to do in this great uh, institution that uh, we will be unveiling uh, pretty soon. So Kelly, thank you so very much for the opportunity. And thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I can feel the passion and the energy in your voice. So thank you for your work, uh, which has been integral to this. Um, and so, Kim, let's uh, turn it over to you. I think that you'll definitely have some insights to share with us on scope, on the scope and process and some, some findings that you found. Yeah, I will uh, share my screen. I'm not going to overwhelm folks with a lot of information, <laughs> but I did want to just uh, jump in and uh, share some things with folks. And I will point out if folks weren't aware that um, uh, my wonderful colleague, uh, Jack, put a link in the chat with the report. I know all of you have been on Zoom all day, so this will not be like what you're used to at work. I'm gonna go through this as quickly as I can to keep things on track so that we can have a conversation. Uh, and there's way too much data in the report uh, for me to share with you during our conversation tonight anyway. Uh, like I said, I'll just highlight a few things for now and say more as we move into the Q&A. Uh, but before I dive in, I wanna pause to thank some folks. Uh, I want to thank Representative Robinson for, for seeing this vision and helping to, to make this happen. Also, uh, Howard Brown for the opportunity to work on this pr project, as well as the Pride Action Tank team. We've had three different interns work on this, along with my colleague, colleague Jackie Thaney, as well as AFC's research and evaluation team, our communications team that made this report so beautiful and has gotten all this information out, both the promotion of the survey as well as uh, the information uh, that you got about this event to the steering committee for this project. Folks who met mostly online uh, for several months uh, and were dedicated enough to get this work through that. Uh, and then, of course, all the folks who took the survey, as well as those who agreed to, to be interviewed. And I also want to give a shout out to the Morton Group, because their 2012 and 2019 community needs assessments have greatly influenced Pride Action Tank's work, our broader work, as well as this particular project. So we consider ourselves um, a little offspring of that needs assessment that the Morton Group did. Um, so Howard Brown brought us in for phase one of this project, which was the community input process. And our charge was to develop and manage a steering committee to lead community engagement and input activities and to develop and present the final report. And I want to note that all of this work was done during the pandemic. <laughs> So there were four goals identified for this project. One was to ensure that we had input from hundreds of, of folks, um, different folks throughout the South Side, as well as identifying the service needs for a community center, uh, identifying and strengthen the community among LGBTQ South Siders, and identify the preferred attributes of the community center itself. Um, with the assistance of Howard Brown's leadership, Representative Robinson and other community members, 15 leaders from the South Side were selected to be on the steering committee. And they represent aid serving organizations, LGBTQ organizations, uh, work in government, education, academia, or serve or represent older adults, ballroom community youth, and other identities important to this project. And the role of the steering committee, committee was to help Pat develop questions engage LGBTQ folks to take the survey, uh, to express their needs and desires and dreams, as well as advise Pride Action Tank on the summary findings. And this picture was from our very first meeting 
And I think Representative Robinson was there and Shannon as well will remember this. It was in February of 2020, and that was the only meeting that we had in person. So uh, this was a mixed methods design and the steering committee helped us every step of the way. Uh, they uh, worked through every single question, every word of every question. We had an online survey that included uh, basic demographics, about, uh, information about medical, behavioral health, uh, incarceration history, and other information uh, about needs and barriers, as well as what folks wanted to see in the center. That survey was out from the end of June to the beginning of September had multiple distribution channels, again, all online. Um, over 200 uh, respondents, uh, and it was a long survey, 38 questions, that's a lot. Yet most folks, over three quarters of folks went all the way through that survey. And although we did offer uh, an incentive at the end, it was a raffle, only 50 people um, uh, submitted for that raffle. Um, so folks were just interested in taking the survey. And then we had stakeholder interviews with eight organization or community leaders and asked them multiple questions over a significant period of time. Um, as a Southsider myself, I'm super conscious about the limited narrative imposed on the South Side. And the steering committee also wanted to give folks the opportunity to say what they're proud of um, uh, about being on the South Side. And here's some of what they offered a lot about community, the people, the history, um, the diversity, the sense of family. Those are the kinds of things that came up when asked that question. In terms of who took the survey, the median age was a 36, which is close to Chicago's median age of 35. Uh, most respondents identified as lesbian, gay, same gender loving, and cisgender. About half the respondents were uh, identified as African-American or black. Um, respondents tended to be fairly educated and stable in terms of income and housing. Uh, but despite the overall financial and housing stability of respondents, those who identify as bisexual and or transgender or non-binary or another gender were not faring as well. Um, and most of the respondents came from the 60615 or 37 zip codes, which is uh, Grand Boulevard, Greater Grand Crossing, Hyde Park, Inwood, Washington Park, and Woodlawn. This, um, so we asked questions about folks' satisfaction with their neighborhood. Uh, here's a quote from one of our respondents. Almost all queer spaces and activities are located on the north side, but there are plenty of LGBTQ plus people in the rest of the city, including the south side. We have to add the expense of time traveling to the north side that north siders do not. And so some of the takeaways from this section of the report, which folks can read, for themselves at this point, because you have the link, is that the majority of respondents expressed general satisfaction with their neighborhood. However, there was an overwhelming dissatisfaction with the number of LGBTQ services. Uh, respondents take pride in their community members always being there for each other and the rich culture of the South Side. And although most respondents feel their neighborhood is pretty safe, Blacks Af slash African-Americans were least likely to feel this way. And while most respondents were at least somewhat satisfied with their neighborhood, they are, as I mentioned, dissatisfied with the number of LGBTQ services. In terms of some of the health uh, services questions that we asked, flipping through the report here, uh, folks talked about the lack of culturally competent LGBTQ services. Um, Respondents who identify as queer, bisexual, and other sexual orientations, cisgender men and or non-binary, trans, and people with other identities are less likely to rate their health as at least good compared to respondents as a whole. And while LGBTQ plus specific services like mental health treatment, counseling, and financial assistance were most often selected as needed during the last 12 months, there are a significant number of services that they did not receive or uh, weren't able to get in part due to the, to the pandemic. 
And then to jump to um, the section about the center itself, I find the right page here. Ah, there we go. Many respondents express the desire for the center to be a space where they feel safe, welcome, and that also is inclusive of everyone in the community. Stakeholders were overall supportive of the center, but expressed concerns about community support, uh, as well as Howard Brown being seen as a North Side organization coming to the South Side. However, they were also willing to work with Howard Brown on the development of the center and reported their relationship with Howard Brown as positive. Uh, key stakeholders were generally supportive of the LGBTQ center, but there are some concerns about the details like collaborations, financial stability of the center and existing organizations. And um, folks talked a lot about centering the cultural heritage of black and Latinx people on the South side. Um, there were also a number of specific things that folks want to see in the center. Um, Folks talked about proximity to public transportation, free Wi-Fi, meeting space, outdoor spaces, recreational spaces, as some of the areas that they want to see uh, happen, some of the things they want to see happen in the center. So that's a quick, quick, quick highlight of uh, some of the things that are in the report. I will say the bottom line is folks are really supportive of the idea of the center. Uh, they just want to know what the details are going to be from who the leadership is within the center, to who runs the center, who makes the decisions about it, and also lots of concerns around making sure that uh, the surrounding community um, is a part of the center from the cultural elements to uh, um, being a part of partnering with existing organizations and that sort of thing. So that's a lot. <laughs> In, in the brief time for, for now, but I know we have Q&A that'll bring out. Thank you, Kim, for providing such an insightful high level overview that, you know, just uh, first of all, it's a beautiful presentation and layout and kind of gives us a precursor of some things that we can take a deep dive into during the Q&A and when all of us afterwards will read the report. Um, so thank you. That was great. And now we'll wrap up this segment in terms of opening remarks with Shannon. Shannon, the floor is yours. Uh, we can't hear you, Shannon. I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, I can't hear you. Can, can uh, Kim and Representative uh, Robinson, can you hear Shannon? I can't either. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't on my end. No. Okay. I wonder if you might need to pop out and pop back in. Yeah, maybe try that. No problem. We'll be, we'll be here. Turn it off and turn <laughs> We're not it back going on. anywhere. <laughs> Not until seven o'clock. <laughs> That's right. We still have some more time together. That, so in addition to being really uh, substantive, Kim, that overview was just so, the graphics were beautiful. Uh, Honey, that is, that is the comms team. I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shout out the comms. <laughs> comms team at AFC, mad props. It's just so beautiful. Oh, they're amazing. Gorgeous, they're amazing. gorgeous. <laughs> You're on mute. How about now? Can Yay! folks see? Yay! You know something? Um, <laughs> one of the things that we are learning <laughs> all through 2020 is that um, expect the unexpected. Um, so again, hey, y'all. <laughs> um, I'm Shannon. Thank you all so much for being so generous and giving a part of your um, evening. I know that you all have looked at Zoom all day. Um, have been at work. I want to start off by echoing um, Representative Robinson and Kim Hunt's thank yous. Um, thank you all so much. I want to say thank you to the steering committee um, as well. You know, the steering committee gave up so much of their time, particularly during in the throes of a pandemic that we're still in nonetheless. 
Um, you know, we really appreciate that dedication. Thank you so much, Pride Action Tank. Thank you, uh, Representative Lamont Robinson. Thank you, Leader Greg Harris. You know, thank you so much to so many people, um, particularly those who participated in the needs assessment. Um, one of the things that I will say is that for years, the drought of LGBTQ specific services, particularly on the South side, um, have largely affected its community members from accessing the services and the resources that they need. And oftentimes when we think of needed resources, we have a tendency to think along the lines of medical provision. And we forget that there's also resources and services that are needed to address things like isolation, childcare, housing, youth services. And that's just really to name a few. Um, but also, I just kind of want to add to that, I don't want to say more importantly, but definitely up there in the rankings, is the need for a, where a, a need for a space where individuals with shared identity can gather safely without fear um, of being harmed for their authentic self. So I just will kind of end there again, you know, I look so forward to talking more about the Southside Community Center and the things to come. Thank you for bearing with me through my mute glitch. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate that. And now we get to go to Q&A with the panel. I'm really excited about this. I know that there's there are going to be uh, some really there's going to be some really good discussion and insights and perspective and things like that. And so let's just dive in. So I have a question that I'd like to direct to Shannon. So Shannon, how will the assessment findings be incorporated into Howard Brown's decisions about the facility? So that is a really great question. Um, thanks for asking it. So I'll start off by saying that from the inception of the needs assessment, um, community input being the driving force behind any decision that's made regarding the facility um, will be at the helm. You know, and I really want to reiterate and drive that down. Um, I would probably also add that as you can guess, there were many stated needs from individuals who provided feedback for the needs assessment. Um, but at the top of those offerings was a place that clearly states, this is an LGBTQ center. And that's really interesting because we really did not think that folks would actually want that. But um, as Kim could probably attest, that was actually at the top of the list that folks want a space that says LGBTQ Center, culturally relevant programming. As I kind of said at the top of my introduction, um, that isolation factor is real. Um, we know that Southside LGBTQ folks have always had each other, um, but to have a space that actually is intentionally created to do that is also really important. Something else that um, was also high in the rankings that folks listed was leadership and internal stakeholders that actually reflect the community. And to be a bit more granular in that Black leadership, that was something that was really held in high regard um, from the individuals who actually participated in the needs assessment. Also, too, I would like to add that not only were LGBTQ specific services at the top of the list, but also ensuring accessibility, um, barrier-free provision, right? Making sure that it's close to public transit and also to just those things that we need on an everyday basis. The things that we need on an everyday basis don't have LGBTQ slapped on them, right? I mean, we need a lot of things outside of what would be considered to be LGBTQ specific. So those are just some of the things to name a few. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Okay, so Kim, question for you here. What findings, if any, surprised you? Um, I, I think many of the findings were more affirming, but what Shannon mentioned about people's openness to have LGBTQ on the, as part of the name, um, like 80% of folks said that. Now there are some slight differences when you look at different subgroups, 
but it's still pretty, pretty high. And folks will see that in the, in the report. Um, I think I, I would also say that there are a number of services and programs that are happening now um, in folks named specific organizations that they're receiving services from. Um, and those are in the report as well. Uh, and, and we know that there are some longstanding organizations that have been on the South Side uh, doing this work like Affinity and, and Brave Space Alliance, uh, to name a two, two of them. Um, I, I think something else that I guess what, I don't know if I would put it in the surprise category, but definitely affirmation around uh, folks' experiences during COVID, uh, the height of COVID uh, in particular, because the survey was out um, due to September uh, and there was no vaccine in sight at that time. And about a third of folks said that uh, COVID had a big impact on them and their ability to get services. And a lot of that is was gender affirming services in particular were named, but also mental health. Folks mentioned isolation quite a bit. Um, and then also having um, the place where they got their, their groceries or their prescriptions filled uh, not available during um, um, protests was something else that came out in the survey. So it was, um, I, I would, obviously COVID has touched everyone, but when you look at how it touched LGBTQ folks and in their particular needs and ability to get what they need um, that is LGBTQ focused, and, and honestly, what some folks named wasn't specifically LGBTQ, as this is Shannon pointed out. I mean, family services, mental health, um, these kinds of things um, were named as, as well. And I bring this up in particular, you know, thinking about just the lack of data that we have on LGBTQ communities in the, during COVID, it's a national issue. Um, so for us to have just a little bit of data based on a couple of questions, uh, I think it's pretty, pretty significant. Thank you, Kim. Representative Robinson, what are your thoughts about how the new center and Howard Brown Clinic will impact LGBTQ plus people and the South Side in general? Representative, you're, you're on mute. mute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm following my, my friend Shannon. <laughs> I forgot to connect to audio, so. <laughs> <laughs> Different from hitting the button, right? Um, Kelly, let me just step back, if I may, um, and talk about um, the, the district that I serve. I serve one of the most diverse districts in the state of Illinois. Uh, the district uh, the district starts as far south as South Shore. Uh, it goes into Washington Park and Woodlawn, Bronzeville, a little bit of Inglewood, uh, the South Loop, the Loop, uh, our business hub, uh, as well as River North, Gold Coast, and Old Town. So high net worth, uh, middle class, low income, and there have been several reports that depending on your zip code depends on your life expectancy. And so for me, it was important to not only have an LGBTQ center on the South side, but it was also important to bring, um, to bring a healthcare center component to the center. Healthcare is so extremely important to us in our community. I um, am so humbled in this remark, but I'm gonna say that, that Mercy Hospital has remained open. It has a new name, but I was at the forefront of keeping that hospital open. That has been in service for 100 years. And for many years, it has serviced the LGBTQ community. Many folks in our community go there for services that are HIV positive. And so with that said, for me, it was important to bring a partner in that, as, as Kim mentioned, people wanted to get services, but they wanted to get their services uh, and feel affirmed, right? Um, and so for me, that was why Howard Brown has been a part of the center. Uh, but separate from that, 
It's important also that we continue the great work that Brave Space Alliance has been doing in Affinity, as well as uh, Black Gay Men's Caucus. This center will only be an extension of the work that these organizations will already do in a larger space. And so if the organizations want to come and use this, this the, the gym, um, in this space or for other services, that is what this, this center is for. Again, the Howard Brown piece is fantastic because we want to have wraparound services. We wanna have healthcare. We wanna uh, at some point uh, look into housing, but it's important again that the community shows up and has ownership in this center. And so that is what, what uh, Kim and Pride Action Tank um, and their report shows us is that the community has the input and we will be using that input to make sure that this center is a success. And so I'm, I am not only uh, um, proud, but I'm overjoyed uh, uh, by this report and the work that we're doing to make sure that we show up and have ownership in this center, Kelly. Thank you, Representative Robinson. And I, I really appreciated your um, elevating and highlighting the work that organizations like Brave Space Alliance, Affinity Community Services, um, and uh, Chicago Black Gay Men's Caucus do, because um, you know, these are community-based organizations, Black-founded and Black-led that are doing the work um, in collaboration with other partners. And I think it's important um, that we always acknowledge Black LGBTQ plus leadership. Um, so thank you for doing that. Shannon, how are you planning to work with LGBTQ plus serving organizations that are already located on the South Side? That is also a fantastic question. And I really want to echo what Representative Robin said, Robinson said, right, is that without the work and the partnership of individuals like organizations, I should say, like Affinity, um, Brave Space and other rooted South Side organizations, we could not have done this work, right? We could not have done that needs assessment um, without folks like Pride Action Tank um, and so many others. We couldn't have done this, right? Um, so to answer your question, first and foremost, through regular transparent communication, that is really important. Um, and creating space for full involvement for those who would like to participate on the upcoming planning board. You know, that's for starters. And I see that um, Solomon asked a question about how folks could get involved. And that is actually one of those ways, right? For individuals who are potentially interested in being inside of the community center, we would love for you all to actually participate on the planning board. Um, one of the things that we know, which I might have said already, is that there are so many organizations who have been doing this work in their community for years, way before there was a community center. So again, that feedback um, and input is really important because what I really want to drive home is that this community center will be for and ran by community members. They are going to determine every function of the community center that goes from what the building will be named, the layout, the offerings, all of those things are going to be determined by the community members who are on the planning board. Again, Howard Brown will not lay claim to any of those things. And I'm saying this on a recorded live <laughs> that is going to, you know, live and breathe and be able to be viewed by many other folks. So I just really want to name that right now. Um, Howard Brown will happily support in the beginning processes and through the planning phases only. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Kelly, um, but that's how I intend on doing that. It's um, really reassuring to hear that commitment um, to relationship, genuine relationship um, with the community, the South Side community at large and wherever the center will be. Uh, thank you. And community leadership, not just input, but leadership and ownership. And I think that's, that's critical. I have a- Can I um, add to that, Kelly? Yes. It's from yeah. the survey and Shannon, I really appreciate you saying that because um, one of the things that came up in the uh, survey and the stakeholder interviews is that even in terms of partnership, many 
uh, existing organizations have or are partnering with Howard Brown mm -hmm. um, right now in some capacity. And, and folks mentioned wanting to have more than more than a space um, um, in terms of partnership, uh, that it should go deeper than that. Uh, not only the decision making, but also capacity building for these organizations, almost like incubation in some cases, so that they can continue to sustain themselves outside of um, outside of having a space to meet or to have have events, because uh, you know it's important to continue to strengthen the infrastructure of organizations that serve um, BIPOC LGBTQ folks. Uh, throughout the city. And um, it, that's what folks uh, in terms of those uh, running organizations or groups have felt like they've been missing, that it hasn't been that investment in um, their organizations and groups that allow them to sustain and continue to serve. In some cases, very, very special, specialized populations that can sometimes get lost in uh, a larger, a larger um, organization. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim, for that. That was that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, Kim, I'd like to ask you a question. You touched on it in your overview, uh, but can you speak more about how COVID nineteen has impacted LGBTQ plus people on the South Side? Yeah. You're on mute, love. You're on mute, Kim. <laughs> Jesus I'm so glad I am in good company. I'm so glad I'm in good company. We're all three done. <laughs> Kill your sister. <laughs> Zoom Chronicles. Oh, yeah, yeah, seriously. Yeah, seriously. We should, uh, it has only been a year and a half of this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, okay, backing up. <laughs> So as I mentioned, the survey went into the field in June. So that's three months into the shelter in place. And so when we asked if uh, respondents, if their needs had changed since March 21st, which is when shelter in place was declared here in Illinois, um, about 35% said that they had and 45, over 45% responded that their ability to access services that they needed had changed. Um, folks cited isolation and lack of opportunities to socialize, the fear and inconvenience of riding public transportation, uh, limitations on their service or healthcare providers, as well as the fear of being exposed to COVID in these settings uh, and reduced income or job loss as ways their service needs have changed since the shelter in place. Um, folks also talked about just delaying their care um, out of this fear, either fear of uh, being exposed to COVID in healthcare settings or uh, an assumption that COVID was being prioritized over anything else. This is, again, including folks who were on hormones, so they weren't able to sustain that. Uh, for a period of time, as well as other healthcare issues. Um, so one person said, for example, pre-COVID, I was able to see my doctor more frequently and wanted to make appointments to check my health. There's a time schedule for being on testosterone with checkups and checking on hormone levels. This since COVID, it's all severely delayed my transition. So these are things that we don't pick up in mainstream studies about. Uh, the impact of COVID and why we really, really, really need more data on the LGBTQ community. And I'm happy to say that the Illinois General Assembly passed legislation this past session, um, HB or SB, I'm sorry, we had 11 pro uh, policy priorities at ASC, <laughs> uh, 2133, uh, which is all about sexual orientation and gender identity data collection in the state of Illinois and 10 state agencies will be required to collect this data. Um, so that's just a little plug for the, for the future, but uh, this survey and statements like this illustrate why it's important. Bravo, thank you, Kim, for that, thank you. 
Okay, so both uh, this question is directed to both Representative Robinson and Shannon. So $15 million is a significant number, right? That's not chump change, but not enough to build uh, or sustain a facility like this. Or question mark, is it? Uh, what are the plans for ensuring this happens and remains an institution on the South side? Uh, is it likely that other public dollars, uh, both city and state can be tapped for this project? So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Kelly, that's a great question. And I want to uh, thank again, um, Shannon uh, for um, uh, clearing um, or making way um, for clarity um, that Howard Brown, uh, when I initially met with them um, and shared with them my vision uh, that they just want to do the healthcare component of the center. Uh, they do not want to have ownership in the center. And I think that's right. important uh, that the community needs to un understand that this center uh, will be built by us. It will be owned by us. Uh, and so that's very clear as we are, as Shannon mentioned, on a recorded line uh, <laughs> and recorded on Facebook and recorded on Zoom. That again, um, I'm appreciative of my friends at Howard Brown, David Nunyar and, and Ken uh, and Dr. Meyer Green and Mario. Uh, and there's some great board members that look like us, look like the, 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 the black community. Um, and so it's great to have a partner that really wants to do the work and not to have ownership. And that's important because this center, this building, we need to finally have something that we own. And this will be the start on this LGBTQ center. The $15 million um, certainly uh, is a nice piece of change, Kelly. Uh, but uh, to sustain the building, um, we need to make sure that the city and state and federal, uh, our federal friends continue to support the efforts in the center. Let me just say that I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled and honored uh, that the mayor, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, that's part of our community, has also stated that she is willing to support the LGBTQ center on the south side with city funds. And so between the state fund and the between the state funds and the city funds, uh, we should have enough resources to be able to get this building up and running. Uh, um, we also have a, a great example um, with uh, the center on Hosted. Uh, they have brought um, folks in that help them offset the cost. And so we'll be looking at retailers, we'll be looking at tenants in this space because we want this space to be around for generations to come. And so that's why it's important uh, for those of you that are interested in being on the planning uh, board uh, that uh, all of these things we'll be looking at to make sure that this building, this facility is going to be self-sufficient. I think Thank Representative you. Robinson said it all right there, is that um, the planning board, the individuals who have agreed or will hopefully agree to be inside the community center will be responsible for the sustainability of the building, right? If that is what is so desired, um, they will be the ones to shepherd this project um, from inception, through the end and for the years to come. And that will take a lot of effort, right? Um, as you all, as you said, Kelly, $15 million is nothing to sneeze at, but when it comes to a community center, that is not a lot of money, you know? And, and I know that there are some folks watching who would probably beg to differ. Um, but again, right, when we're talking about the cost the sustainability, um, just making sure that this is something for years to come, as Representative Robinson stated, we don't have much of anything that is Black, especially LGBTQ, on the South Side. Yes, we're very fortunate to have Brave Space, right? We're very fortunate to have other long-standing entities, um, but we need more. And this will be a welcome and needed addition, but again, it will require the sustainability and the efforts of those individuals who have agreed to be in this space and share community in it. 
thank you for those reflections. And, you know, sometimes we have to uh, talk about the resources, the dollars, like we need as much as possible, right? And Mm -hmm. what we have is great, but if we wanted to stick around um, and into the future, we need more. And that's just real. Uh, So thank you both for sharing that. Kim, why was it important uh, to Pride Action Tank to do this project? Wow. Uh, so a couple of parts to that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's me as a South Sider. <laughs> and then there's Pride Action Tank. And, and since Representative Robinson and Shannon have been so honest and forthcoming, I will say that I didn't say yes right away. Uh, in part because <laughs> I, know I got a couple of emails like, girl, what you gonna do? Um, <laughs> And, and it's because, you know, I, I ran Affinity for many years. And so I know what it's like to have to be an organi- a smaller organization budget wise, doing a lot of work and sometimes under the radar uh, and, and with a, a population that isn't always seen or uh, paid attention to and uh, have had the experience of working with uh, larger, uh, better resourced organizations where it hasn't always worked out uh, beneficially for the smaller organizations. So I really had to, to think about this, um, this project and, and first my own personal um, stuff, um, but also looking at Pride Action Tank uh, and came to a place where, you know, I had to remember why we founded Pride Action Tank, Tracy Bame and I, almost six years ago now. And it was in part to demonstrate a way of playing well with others, <laughs> demonstrate coll- what collaboration could look like and, and demonstrate, um, just to demonstrate, but being a, a partner that could fill a gap that um, because of missions and history and other things that other organizations couldn't necessarily feel or had to explain a lot to feel. We didn't come with the same kinds of baggage and history. Um, and, and then looking at Pride Action Tank's mission around collaboration and innovation and bringing folks to the table who aren't usually brought to the table and really uh, pushing more community level decision-making and, and visioning and viewing views, um, you know, it, became apparent the more I thought about it that Pride Action Tank needed to do this work. And part of it was the trust factor both of me and the reputation of, of Pride Action Tank. Uh, and, and part of it was the way that we do our work. If community is we are not interested in doing it. So uh, knowing that this was a community input process where uh, Howard Brown was saying, and I fully believe them that they really wanted to hear from community no matter what was said. Um, and they honored that all the way through the process. So, um, and, and this is historic, right? And also I wanted to make sure that um, the voices of existing efforts, organizations, folks who don't run organizations but are doing great work uh, were also included in this process whether uh, those organizations wind up being a part of this center uh, in terms of physically moving there or partnering or whatever it may be, I wanted to make sure that their voices were captured too. So all those things together and, and really leaning into the mission of Pride Action Tank was why it was important. And, I, and I'm grateful, it was a wonderful experience. I will say that um, the steering committee in particular, I just, want to, again, Shannon has mentioned them, I've mentioned them, really want to take my hat off to steering committee members who so faithfully showed up to these Zoom meetings after being on Zoom all day. There was one meeting where we went through every line in the survey. Y'all, there were 38 questions. (laughs) 38 questions. We went two hours with our research and evaluation team, went through every single word. Um, so that's that's dedication, and and I appreciate them so much. 
that's dedication, commitment, and then also just in terms of the leadership, I have to say that, you know, um, you know, you um, have provided and Shannon and all of the steering committee members, it really um, is an example of co genuine collaboration and effort and, and community centered um, approaches to working um, on, on to get things off the ground. And instead of community being, oh, well, we've designed this now come on board and tell us what you think about it. It's like, no, like, in terms of even like, is this something you want? If so, like, what do you want? What do you need? What's important to you? Like, those are the, uh, that is, a, it's a way of being and it's an approach. It's not just something you check off the list. <laughs> and so uh, thank you so much, all of you for demonstrating that. So before we turn it over to um, Q&A with our um, audience here, Kim, I have, you know, one, one more thing to ask you, like, what are some of the top issues that uh, people identified? Yeah, it, it, it depends on the, the area, you know, people were really clear about what they wanted to see in the center. So I encourage people that's, that's the biggest section of this report. Um, but access to culturally competent Healthcare was huge, came up over and over again. Access to mental health services came up over and over again. You know, the fact that this happened in, during the pandemic, food, housing, jobs, people lost jobs or lost hours during the pandemic. Um, uh, those kinds of things for sure. And, you know, I will say too that. Um, the majority of folks, and this is contrary to, uh, you know, narratives around the South Side and, and Black families in particular, the majority of folks talked about how welcoming they felt the South Side was uh, to them. There are some fluctuations depending on I identity under the rainbow, so to speak. Um, but folks felt such a strong, strong sense of community and taking care of each other. That came up a lot too, um, again, in the context of the pandemic, but even outside of that. But um, culturally competent care <laughs> came up over and over and over again. And then there were specific types of services that folks talked about, you know, uh, services for LGBT older adults, services for, for youth, um, those kinds of things and other population specific services. You Ke that. Kelly, can I can I mention something? Sure. Um, I looked at other um, federal qualified healthcare centers, um, but I will tell you that uh, Kim mentioned a couple times that folks want to be able to um, get healthcare where they feel comfortable, and so I cannot think of a better organization that has been doing that um, in our community. And some folks can say on the north side, um, but Howard Brown has been on the south side. And so again, I couldn't think of a, a better marriage, so to speak, than partnering with Howard Brown to make sure that when folks get services, healthcare services, that they can go someplace and be and feel affirmed. And so uh, it, 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 it's great that, the study um, uh, says that uh, because it looks like we are doing the right thing. And so you can have the vision as you mentioned, um, but you have to make sure you do right by the community. And so that's why it was extremely important to make sure that uh, the study um, was complete. And I also would be remiss, and, and I'm gonna shut up Kelly, I promise, that Howard Brown was the only um, um, healthcare center that reached out to me to um, get my folks tested, get COVID testing in my district, particularly on the south side of my district. And so I want to give kudos to Howard Brown because on several occasions, they work with me to make sure that my community um, received COVID testing. And so I'm, I am extremely appreciative and thankful for Howard Brown and the folks that I mentioned a little earlier uh, that work at Howard Brown and do this work 365 days a year. You know, Representative Robinson, I also just want us to throw in there that not only um, has Howard Brown risen to the call with the standalone clinics at 63rd and 55th, um, but also 
those other um, clinics that we have at 47th Street, right? Um, those are the clinics that we actually do a lot of LGBTQ competent care, but not just LGBTQ care, right? We do community care um, because what we know is that community, regardless of their identity, regardless of orientation, needs solid care. And during the pandemic, as Representative Robinson said, we were there to make sure that we were in the communities through mobile, um, that we were having the community care stations at various spaces, not only at clinics, but at various churches on the South and the West side, um, parking lots in South Shore. Um, in your center. Were, yes, exactly. Those were, those were things that were shepherded by Dr. Maya Green. You know, so again, I just want to make it very clear um, that not only have our standalone clinics on the South side been there to answer the call, but we made sure that we brought clinic to community in the neighborhoods at most critical times. That's really important. Thank you uh, both for speaking to that. I think going where people are um, is very important. And I also appreciated uh, your expanding on that, Shannon, because, you know, obviously um, Howard Brown um, has a deep connection to an origin story closely, you know, connected to the LGBTQ um, history and people. However, many people um, access services of Howard Brown uh, uh, who are not LGBTQ. And so I think that that speaks to also the greater community. So thank you for sharing that. All right, it is 634 now and it is your time audience folks. So it's now time for, for our uh, very distinguished panelists here to uh, answer your questions. So feel free to put them in the chat, but we have several uh, to work with here. Uh, so let's start with first, this is a question uh, from Jacob on Facebook. Uh, my question is, what are the biggest barriers and challenges that LGBTQ people face when accessing health care? Some of you spoke to that, um, but okay. Also, are there specific needs at the end of life, for example, hospice and palliative care uh, that this population needs? That's a great question, Jacob. Thank you. Anyone want to take that? That is a fantastic question. Um, so we have an aging services department um, at Howard Brown that actually supports those very things. I, I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm anywhere near old, um, but however, unlike a lot of my elder counterparts, trans people namely are living a lot longer. I personally do think about myself being a 60, 70, maybe 80 year old woman. And I do wonder what does that look like for me? I think about our elders like um, Gloria Allen, for instance, and other folks. And I think about how they deserve to be in an affirming space that will make sure that they're cared for in a way that is respectful in a way that is competent and um, in a way that censors the life that needs to be honored, right? So as we envision that for the Southside Community Center and our future expansion potentially, those are things that we need to consider. You know, we need to get a lot more focused on palliative care, you know, because that's a bridge that we all cross at some point. Folks living with HIV are living regular, normal life expectancy to life expectancy, right? Um, those are things that we do have to consider. So again, thank you so much for that. Um, I would love to engage you with the conversation with aging services for sure. Thank you. And, and Kelly, if I, if I may. Go ahead, Representative. Uh, Jacob, that, is, that, that uh, is, a, is a great question, which is in the second phase of this project, really looking at um, a holistic approach of healthcare. And part of that is making sure that you have appropriate housing. And so many of our seniors um, have to go back in the closet when they go into senior homes. Uh, I um, am honored to 
uh, have some of the larger senior buildings um, in the city of Chicago. I have a huge senior population in my district, which Shannon mentioned that we did several COVID testings at many of these senior buildings. Uh, but also having a, a housing component uh, to this center is something that uh, I want the community to work with me on because housing is extremely important to making sure that you have adequate health care. And so Jacob, kudos to you. And we hope uh, that we can bring you in deeper into this conversation around health care. And, and I will just add, you know, I, I mentioned cultural competency before. It, it's so incredibly important. Um, folks who don't feel welcome in healthcare settings don't come back to healthcare settings. They don't get the tests they need. They don't get the follow-up care that they need. And cultural competency is from the time folks park the car, get off the, the bus or whatever it is, Hit that front door all the way through seeing the service provider and any follow-up communications. So uh, this is a huge issue, whether it's in uh, healthcare or housing. Uh, all of the things that Shannon and Representative Robinson mentioned hinge on folks being comfortable and being free to share uh, all the things that they need to share so that they get what they actually need to continue to thrive. So um, that cannot be stated enough <laughs> that, uh, because we, can't, we cannot build our way out of this situation. We're gonna have more LGBTQ folks than we have LGBTQ spaces. So, you know, part of even having a, a center with LGBTQ in the name um, uh, is also a, a in some ways, uh, a beacon and an opportunity to educate other institutions. Uh, and I know we did that a lot at Affinity. We all do this work, right? How many cultural competency trainings? <laughs> you know, all of us participate in at some level. Uh, so it's huge um, to get to, we want our people to thrive from the cradle to the grave. Um, mm -hmm. And we deserve that. We do. Yeah, absolutely. We I'm, deserving um, of that. I'm going to live with Kim, Representative Lamont Robinson and Kelly when I get yes. to age. So they're going to take You're me care of up. me. In some form. You're going to be around, Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> I got to jump on them. all y'all. <laughs> we would have a blast. Can you imagine? We would be a riot. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh my. my goodness. The talk about the Golden Girls. Oh. oh, my gosh. I love it. You would be Dorothy, Shannon. Oh my God, in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Right on the money. Okay. Right on the money. All right, moving on to our next question from Paula. So um, what will Paula, uh, yeah, Paula in, uh, in the Zoom, will the new center include programming for LGBTQ older adults? So yes, we talked about health care and end of life things, but that's not just for older people. That could be for any of us, mm -hmm. right? But what yeah. other kinds of programming for um, LGBTQ older adults? Can you like you want to jump in? I just want to point out that that Paula is the director of the Illinois Department on Aging uh -huh. who asked that question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your question. That's a good question, Paula. <laughs> Thank you. Who is a, a member of our community, and thank goodness she is there because she has really <laughs> queered up the department uh, in so many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And Pride Action Tank, I know uh, Kelly Rice from Howard Brown works very closely with Paula. So. Paula, yes. we love you and, and, and thank you. And look, I mentioned a little earlier that um, I have, again, in the city of Chicago, the largest senior population of senior buildings, many of them CHA buildings, and so many of them low income. And so I have taken a lot of heat for not doing a senior center. Um, and I do have an election coming up. And so I might be asking for many of you that are tuning in for your support, uh, but uh, why was it important to do this senior center again? Even though this, excuse me, this LGBTQ center, this is an LGBTQ center, but we have always opened our doors to everyone. And so I know that the community 
um, uh, will open, the center will be open to everyone, seniors and youth. And so for my vision is that this would be a community center that everyone will be able uh, to come and enjoy this center. And so to, uh, Paula, we look forward to working with you and the city's Department of Aging, uh, and again, the host of, of seniors in my district to make sure that we have a programming at the center. Moreover, as an educator, I look forward to working with city colleges to make sure that we have a GED courses and other courses at the center. That way that we can, again, make sure that, that overwhelmingly uh, that we are getting at the needs of the community. And so uh, this center, again, I know that we talk about it being LGBTQ. I know that we talk about um, having um, LGBTQ in the name, but overall, this is a community center that everyone will be able to come to and feel comfortable and, and be able to pick up some skills, uh, to be able to make sure that they uh, get the services that they need. That's right, yeah. Um, I do wanna also add that it is so important to us that we consider partners who do that intergenerational work you know, um, that is something that, again, we definitely want to see inside of the Southside Community Center. Um, as Kim and Representative Lamont have said, and Kelly and myself, um, so often we think about LGBTQ needs as being so exclusive um, of our general community. And we need childcare, right? We need yes. dialysis. Um, we need blood pressure medicine. We are so much more than what public health has put on us for the past 40, 50 years. And while those realities are true, nonetheless, we are whole individuals who do need whole care. We do age, we do need funerals, <laughs> you know, all of those other things. Um, Shout out to Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation, um, who does amazing senior care on the South Side. Um, though they are not LGBTQ specific, again, just talking about the needs of um, organizations who do that senior work, that is really important, right? So we definitely are looking for partners to support us in that as well. Thank you for that question. Yes, that was an outstanding question. Thank you. Okay, so there's a question here asked about, um, and you touched on it, but um, about uh, steps that Howard Brown um, can take to repair the relationships with queer Black folks on the South Side. But each of you spoke to that in terms of the relationship building, the input from the community on the front end, um, opportunities to be on the planning board uh, at the center and those kinds of things. So thank you for speaking to that. Um, and then there's- Can I say a, something else though? Sure, go that? ahead. Um, I, I, I thank you for that question because that reality has not escaped me. That reality has not escaped community members and that reality has not escaped those of us who work within the organization. Um, I think that it would we be remiss to shirk away from that question and not give an answer. And though the answer I might give you may seem very vague or nebulous, it really is about us taking the steps daily and actively to make sure that we're being held to account to account of doing that repair work, right? But we also want individuals to support us in being that change agent. Um, I think because no matter how much we ourselves internally want to do that repair work, we definitely want to work with individuals who are willing to work with us, you know? Um, so I definitely want to say that. Um, Howard Brown throughout 2020 and some of 2021 has done a lot of capacity building work through the support of many Black and Black queer-led organizations. Um, and those are some of the things that we continue to do um, throughout the year and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for expounding on that. And so how would, uh, if one were interested in joining the planning board, um, as well as, you know, as a community member, either as an individual or an organization wanting mm -hmm. to get involved in the continuation of the planning and implementation process, either through the planning board or any other, um, through any other mechanism, how would one go about doing that? What is the process to get engaged in, uh, in that way? Uh, another really, oh, no, please go ahead, Representative Robinson. 
Uh, uh, Shannon, go, go right ahead. So right now we are in the really nascent phases of that planning board. Um, one of the things that I will say is when we're visualizing, when we're envisioning the planning board, we want individuals on the board who are actually going to be stakeholders of the community center, right? We want those individuals to treat this as if they're planning their own home. You know, that's the thing. Um, while external feedback is necessary and will be welcomed, as far as the planning board is concerned, just like any other board, right? We want those individuals to be individuals who have some form of commitment. Um, again, right, no one's holding you with a contract or anything that's legally binding, right? None of that, again, recorded conversation. Um, but we do want individuals who have the intention of saying this may be something that I'm interested in being in for the long haul and shepherding um, throughout the duration of the center. Um, so those are things that are, will, that are really important. Will there be um, open applications for the planning board? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Aisha, for asking that question. Um, there is currently a description of the planning board that I do have. Um, and I would love to, again, give that to individuals who are interested in potentially being on that planning board who could potentially be stakeholders within the center. So yes, thank you so much for that question. Representative Robinson, I'm so sorry Shannon, to cut you off. Shannon, well said. Uh, oh, Kelly, okay. you can go to the next question. I'm <laughs> right on the money, Shannon, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so Kim, you touched on earlier uh, some of the findings from the survey in terms of um, the um, the, the services and support that people need financially in terms of financial health and in terms of employment um, and, and gainful employment where people can actually have a shot at taking care of themselves. And so Angelina on Facebook has a, has a great question. Uh, the question is, um, I have a question on behalf of the Chicago LGBTQ Worker Center. What were some trends that were found that pertained to either economic justice for LGBTQ community members on the South Side, such as lack of jobs, lack of financial stability, underemployment, and lack of leadership opportunities, et cetera? And what are some ideal solutions that we may see come to fruition to change the trajectory of the lack of resources that can combat the issues reported? So I'll say that some of that is outside of the scope of the needs assessment, but uh, generally everything that Angelina <laughs> named <laughs> came up. Uh, so all of those things uh, were, were, were things that folks mentioned. Um, and, and clearly, you know, folks are, are have been suffering through the pandemic and, and for many folks even before. Uh, and I'll say our... Um, the respondents for this needs assessment skew towards those with more financial stability. And I think that's in, in large part because other folks didn't have time to, this just was not top of mind for them. They were uh, busy trying to survive. So I think that's an opportunity area uh, in terms of getting further input to, to talk to more folks who are, um, not as economically stable. And in terms of the solutions piece, I'll put a, in a plug for uh, Pride, uh, uh, Pride Action Tank's next summit, uh, the first day of which will be July 31st, and you'll start seeing some information come out next week. We're, we're having, it's called Co-Creating Futures, a BIPOC LGBTQ plus planning uh, policy and practices summit. And the first day, will just be for BIPOC LGBTQ folks and the focus is on visioning a new future. Uh, and out of this, and this is a process like all things Pride Action Tank, uh, eventually we'll get to some of those solutions that Angelina um, is uh, calling for, including policy solutions. Um, so stay tuned for that. And that'll be a deeper dive into uh, even deeper dive, I'll say, into what folks are want to see for the future um, out, outside of uh, this particular project. Thank you, Kim. 
Next question from Kim on Zoom, or Chris on Zoom, excuse me. Will this facility and its programming have opportunities to bridge the gap between the South and North Side communities? Can you repeat that question? You're kind of low. I want to hear that again. Sure. Will this facility and its programming have opportunities to bridge the gap between the South and North Side communities? That is a fantastic question. I'm going to tell you, here's what I'll say. I believe that there is great opportunity for that to happen by virtue of, I think me and all the other panelists here, as well as the viewers know that for years, Black South Siders have had to travel North for services. Um, and while there were services in our backyards, we were not always um, confident that we would be safe in those spaces. Mm -hmm. um, we know that Though the north side may have been a haven of sorts, if you will, we cannot ignore the history of hostility that Black and Brown folks have faced, right? Who seek refuge um, in places like North Halstead, aka Boys Town, you know, so on and so forth. So, in terms of bridging that gap, I think that. Um, with us building capacity and community and sustainability for LGBTQ members of the South side, I think that the North side will have to rise to the occasion. I would like to believe so at least. Um, I believe that black folks and brown folks who are South siders will kind of show the North side that, hey, you need us. You need our bodies to fill your spaces and to bring forth traffic. And I think that with building our own community up for us to be in, I think that's gonna send a message to the North side, you know? Um, I sit in the North side office right now, but again, you know, I, I, I wanna I want be transparent about that fact, but I am a South sider and I would love nothing more than to be in my own community accessing services that reflect my needs. Yeah. Shannon, uh, right, right on the money. Um, and, and Kelly, if I may, um, I have had several conversations um, um, with the CEO of North of Center, Center on Hosted, uh, Tico, and uh, Tico has already stated uh, that he is willing uh, to work with us as we build the center and make sure uh, that we're partnering. Um, and so the answer is yes. Uh, we look forward uh, to to partnering with organizations. Uh, on the north side. Also, we have many brothers and sisters that look like this panel that live on the north side. Mm -hmm. And so um, our doors are open. Uh, even though we don't have physical doors, the center has, has yet to be built. Uh, but as we are going through this planning stage, our doors are open to our north side organizations and our north side brothers and sisters. Outstanding. Yeah. Well, y'all, this has been, it's 6.55. And so um, we have to now close out. I know the time went by so incredibly oh quickly. However, I do want to assure folks um, uh, whose questions we did not get to. Um, so AIDS Foundation of Chicago, AFC, has actually copied AFC Pat has copied the questions in the chat. And so there will be an opportunity to get answers to those questions, whether it's text, email, social media. So please don't think your questions will be ignored. It's just that there are so many like questions in the chat, which is a fantastic thing. I love this energy and you know critical analysis and curiosity and wanting to get engaged. So we're not ignoring you. We just have to bring this particular conversation to a close. So on that note, note, I just want to thank all of you who have joined us this evening uh, via Facebook, via Zoom, etc. Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you to Kim L. Hunt, Shannon Lynn Parker, Representative Lamont Robinson, and me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you so much for this robust discussion. Um, and if you have feedback or questions after tonight's conversation, or want to share your thoughts with us, you can do so 
at Pride Action Tank at AidsChicago.org. Again, that's Pride Action Tank at AidsChicago.org. And so I want to thank everyone, like the Southside Steering Committee, Pride Action Tank, Howard Brown, AIDS Foundation of Chicago, all of the individuals and folks who responded um, you know, to the um, survey that really helped us get this information and your insights and your lived experiences and data and Representative Robinson, your leadership. I wanna thank each and every single one of you. This has been a fantastic conversation. Let the questions and conversations continue. Again, this is, uh, I'm Kelly Suzanne Salisbury. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. I had a great time facilitating this conversation uh, and good night y'all. Be well, ciao. Good night everybody, have a good night. Ciao.